welcome back everybody we're now gonna do sound amazing with one click mastering and there i am and there you are hello everybody in the chat room so we've been spending the last 20 minutes trying to resolve uh, issues with getting New York on the line uh, to do this thing, and we can't. So yours truly is just going to play you the video, and I want you to know right up front, I lied. It's not exactly one-click mastering. I thought it was. Then when I saw the video, I went, well, not exactly one-click, but it sure is easy, and it sure is remarkable. So I'm going to just play you the video. Um, I wish that we could get one of the guys from the company on with us to answer questions about it. We'll bring him back and have him join us on a taxi TV. But for now, let us go watch this video from Remaster Media. I think that you guys will be seriously impressed. This is so cool. If you've got headphones, no, it wasn't a, a clickbait title. It was me not knowing everything I needed to know. Um, anyway, put on your headphones. Uh, I think you're going to think this is really cool because I watched it a couple days ago and went, wow, here we go. Welcome to the world of professional mastering. This is the Remaster Media Pro Mastering Plugin. It's a powerful pro-grade tool with a simple set of features designed to give you amazing results with the push of a button. We have pro musicians and engineers using it, along with students, indie artists, and podcasters. And they all use it for the same reason. It's simple to use, and it makes everything sound better, fast. In fact, one major producer nicknamed it the Better Button. You'll see and hear what he means in just a moment. Let's quickly run through the interface. First, you'll see bass and treble controls. And they'll add either density or brightness to your overall mix. They're very nuanced and very subtle. Next is your output ceiling, and this will cap your mix output, the level at which your mix will be printed at zero on a volume meter. You can bring that back to minus three or minus one, whatever you choose. Next is the processing. This is where you can dial in more or less of digital power station magic into your mix. Use it judiciously. Next, by clicking the center M, that's how you'll turn the plugin off and on. When you run your music, you'll see it glowing to let you know that it's seeing the audio signal. Now, this is the feature I love the most. And really, it's what sets the Remaster Media Pro apart from other mastering technologies. By clicking the Stereo Enhancement button, your mix will come alive. This is true enhancement of the actual stereo field in your mix. It's not artificial. It will bring out all of the detail, depth, environment, and character that exists in your mix. You'd have to work long and hard to get what we give you with the push of a button. Now, you can widen the balls but this should be used for things like an orchestral track or a sound design where you really want to exaggerate the listening field. But for most pop, rock, hip hop, etc. type tracks, leave them where they are. Set it and forget it. Lastly, are a series of five mastering profiles designed by our engineers. They are different mastering personalities that you can choose from based on your personal taste. And the cool thing is that each profile is very transparent. They don't color your mix, and they're not genre-specific. You choose what works best for your music and how you like to hear it. You'll hear them in action in the next segment. And note, we'll be adding more of these in the not-too-distant future, so you'll have even more options. Now, here's the thing. With the exception of clicking the M, pressing the Stereo Enhance button, and choosing a profile, you probably won't need to adjust anything else. The results you'll get just by doing these three things will be pretty incredible. Less is truly more. Now, hearing is believing. Okay, let's get into it. I've lined up five different tracks to master. Pop, singer-songwriter, hip-hop, rock, and a track I produced where the plugin actually saved my bacon. I'll explain more when we get there. 
I've made some personal choices as to which profiles I'm using on each track, but you'll hear me flip through the others in real time so you can see how they affect each mix differently. Focus on the levels of transformation and how simple it was to get there. I'm not going to be twisting a lot of dials because I don't have to, and neither do you. Okay, the first song is from a wonderful artist, Sarah Schmidt, otherwise known as Sweet Lorraine. It's a well-produced pop tune, which already sounds pretty good, but we're going to take it to the next level. We'll start with the plug-in off. You'll hear what the track actually sounds like, and then I'll click the M. Here we go. Look at me, baby. Take a good look at me, baby. I already like what you see. You gotta work it, get back on your feet. Cause you know this is a two way street. You gotta work it, get back on your feet. You ain't getting nothing for free. Next up is a song from singer-songwriter John Pousset Dart, who's had a storied career in acoustic rock. John's a brilliant musician and guitarist. Let's listen to his track and see if we can't bring out even more depth and detail to an already good mix. Okay, let's do a 180 now and check out some hip-hop acid jazz. This is a well-constructed library track, but in my mind, it needs to feel like the real deal from a production point of view. I want to feel deeper bass, more overall intensity, and some cool stereo imaging. Thank you. 
Now, let's rock. Dave Powers is a killer guitarist, and this is a cut from his CD. Again, well-performed and recorded, but I think it can be even better. Finally, a track composed by my partner, Bob Christensen, for an industrial film. This demo was presented to the client, who loved it, and we were set to do a final mix the next day, except that the client changed their mind and wanted to ship that same day. A full mix was impossible, so I took this demo, went into a conference room, ran it through the Remaster Media Pro, and told them to listen to this. They were blown away. And here's what I did. Okay, so now you've seen and heard what I've heard. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't, um, Tony Bon Jovi just couldn't make it today. He had a session or something and, and couldn't get out of it. And Peter, uh, who's a very dear friend of mine as well, couldn't uh, get any of three browsers to work with the software that would bring him in live, you know, on the video feed. So we do have, I believe that's Tony, um, answering questions in the chat. 
Uh, is that you, Tony? I mean, is that you, Peter, under... Uh, re- Andrew. Oh, that's Andrew from Remaster. Okay, so Andrew, why don't you just chat with folks and answer their tech questions uh, in the chat, and I'll just hang out here and look pretty. Did anybody write down the coupon code? <laughs> Bria will post it in the chat. <laughs> Lola Parks can say looking good. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, hair and makeup. It's a professional outfit here that we run. Oh, that's a good question. How long is the coupon valid for? Aw, oh, thanks, Laura. <laughs> it's funny when I go back and watch older versions and my hair is less salt and pepper. It's more pepper than salt. And now it's getting to be about 50-50. I'm an old man. Yeah, Pat War brings up a great question. Uh, are there any level match demos on the website? Which I understand watching this, that, you know, things come in at whatever level, and this takes it up to max level along with all else that it does. Uh, it's forty nine ninety five, Julie. Hey, Ron Schultz. The coupon will be valid for a while. <laughs> we, we actually need an end date. A while won't cut it, Remaster Media. I think actually what I discussed with you guys was like keeping it up for a couple of weeks, but we can bring back a special at some point. If you do it for one year, the people will just drift in and out whenever they feel like it. Um, <laughs> coupon valid till next road rally. Uh, I say we make the coupon valid till December 1st. Anybody who's serious about wanting to buy it would certainly be able to cough up forty nine ninety five by then. And by the way, Taxi doesn't make a penny on this, and I'm not charging these guys a sponsor fee or anything. They're just two very old, dear friends of mine that I've known for decades, many decades. Um, Yeah, let's keep it up till December 1st. Cause, yeah, if you just leave it open-ended for a year, people will think about it and not do it. And uh, maybe I'll get it next month when I'm in a pinch. Just, It's really impressive. It's ridiculously easy to operate. <sighs> Buy it for yourself as an early stocking stuffer. Wow, you see $149.95? Maybe that's not the taxi price. How old are these guys? Why do you even ask? This is fun. I just get to stare at the camera. <laughs> I don't have to work. Bria and I are like on vacation right now. Oh, they, they are very old friends. I get it. Um, yeah, I've, I've known Tony Bon Jovi since 19... 
80, I believe. So I've known him for, what's the math on that, 40 years, 41 years. And I've known Peter, who I believe is answering in the chat as RM Media or Remaster Media. I've known Peter for 12 years, I believe. Um, sing to us. No, thank you. Uh, I will tell you, Tony Bon Jovi is an interesting guy. Uh, oh, thanks, Cass. Cass likes the floral arrangement. Grocery store flowers arranged by moi. <laughs> um, anyway, it was uh, around 1980, and I was senior engineer at Triad Recording Studios in Fort Lauderdale, and I was not happy with the way my big honking JBL monitors, you know, we had uh, like a pair of 4311s on the meter bridge for near field monitoring, eventually, I think NS10s. But I had these big JBL monitors uh, for, you know, the big speakers. And they, it's the room just, did, the control room just didn't sound good. And I met Tony Bon Jovi because I was one of the earliest members of an organization called SPARS, the Society of Professional Audio Recording Studios. And it had like criteria and the record plant, you know, all, all the top studios. There were like eight or nine studios that formed this organization and you had to be invited to join. And I actually, or Triad Recording, got invited to join. So got to rub elbows with all the other uh, people who owned top studios. Um, and I met Tony Bon Jovi. He was the owner and impresario behind um, what was then called Avatar, it was called the Power Station. Um, and it was in New York, built in an old power station uh, in Midtown Manhattan. And the Stones were, I mean, just every major band you can think of worked in that room. <clears throat> I'd not seen it. And then one day I had to go to New York to work on uh, something. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still in Fort Lauderdale. I had to go to New York and work on something. And I called Tony and I said, I need a quarter inch machine. I've got to do a really quick edit on something. And he said, well, Studio A um, has Aerosmith in there, but they're out this week, but the room is set up for them. If you go in and all you do is use the monitor section of the console, which was a gorgeous classic Neve at the time, um, feel free to uh, use the room. So I go in there and they had a room my stuck up in the ceiling and uh, Joe Perry from Aerosmith was sitting out in the room by himself, didn't even notice I was in the control room and he's just sitting there on a drum stool with a stick whacking a snare drum. And so I opened up the room mic uh, and listened and I almost peed myself, it sounded so good. It just sounded amazing. So eventually I finished doing my edit, he got up and walked out of the room and I went out there and did what all audio engineers do, you know, clap. <laughs> I clap harder, but I'm close to a microphone. And you just listen to the room. And I went, oh, my God. And then I started obsessively listening to records that were done um, at the power station. It just, oh, my God, that is my favorite live room. And then I was back there for something else. And some maybe the Stones were in there. And they um, invited me in the uh, control room. I got to hang out while they were cutting some tracks. And oh, all I can tell you is... If it's possible to fall in love or in lust, I guess, with a room, I did. So Tony was the guy who designed that room. He's now uh, got the same room. He took the blueprints and built the same exact room in Pompano Beach, Florida, which oddly enough was where I lived when I was working at Triad. Um, and, and Tony's like a mad scientist, you know, he, he's, I, I don't know how to explain him other than saying he's a genius. He's brilliant. Um, he uh, he's funny. He's odd in a good way, <laughs> but he's so smart. And he's done stuff like uh, doing acoustics and, and audio stuff for uh, private jets and just all kinds of stuff. But he's also engineered and produced a, a lot of really big stuff. But just brilliant. And um, so. And Peter and I've known each other for about a dozen years. Um, and uh, 
Peter called me one day and said, you know, I'm working with Tony on this thing. And I said, you know Tony? He goes, of course, I've known Tony forever. So it was great. Two good friends of mine uh, working with each other. And Peter told me about this and he, he gave me a download, I don't know, probably nine months ago or something. And I've been so busy that I haven't downloaded it and used it yet. So it wasn't until I saw the video the other day where I went, whoa, dude, this is really incredible. So... Um, that's that. Um, Peter is in the chat. Okay, good. Uh, is he in as Peter Greco or is he yeah. in? Okay, great. Hey, Peter in the chat. Um, yeah, I'm just going to let you guys ask questions and, and let Peter and... Andy and whoever is answering the other questions um, from them answer. For anybody who watches this later, they're going to think this is odd. I'm just staring at the screen, but I'm just watching the uh, the comments go by. So hopefully you've got the comments open if you're watching the video after the fact as well to refresh. Uh... Wow, you used to work at Howard Schwartz many moons ago. Were, were you there when I was there? I was after Fort Lauderdale. I went to New York and... Uh, ended up uh, becoming studio manager at Howard Schwartz Recording, which was the preeminent audio post facility probably anywhere in the world. I'd love that place. I loved all the studios I worked at. What can I say? I'm a studio rat. Oh, that's an interesting question from Jamie Hoffman. Um, can you use the mastering program to record and then master, or do you have to use a separate program to record and send it over to this program? So I took that to mean, could you like use this plugin? Like if you're recording drums, could you put this on the drums and go to, you know, go to tape, <laughs> tape in air quotes. Ah, oh, you were the music supervisor on staff. Cool. Was that when Howie added the uh, digital compositing rooms or whatever he had? Or was it motion? Did he have motion graphics in there or something? I remember there was some video component that he added. Ah, oh, came over with the super dupe engineers. Yeah, I missed that whole period of my life, man. I loved it. I loved living it. I lived on the Upper West Side, 72nd and Columbus. Worked at Howie's. Uh, at one point, right after I started work, I came on board as low man on the totem pole engineer because I came from doing records. And Howie said, you don't know anything about posts. And I said, how hard can it be? You know, I, I've recorded gold and platinum records. He goes, trust me, not the same thing. He was so right. So um, I, I was low man on the totem pole engineer. I filled in when the other engineers went on vacation, what have you. And then the studio manager left. And I said to Howie, I can run this place. He goes, You've only been here three months. He said, trust me, I can run it. So I just went in to uh, the office, the manager's office, put down my briefcase and started running the place. Shortly thereafter, Howie met Elaine, his second wife, uh, met her on a Staten Island ferry, fell in love, took his American Express card, went to Newark Airport, and they went to like the south of France or something over there in Europe, maybe Italy, I don't remember. And he was gone. He rented a Porsche Cabriolet and he was gone for like a year or something <laughs> ridiculous. And while he was gone, um, brought, I brought in uh, Thundercats, uh, 
uh, the cartoon series, and we set up two rooms down on the 17th floor where the uh, where the shop was, and had Thundercats cranking like 10, 12 hours a day on top of the, let's see, upstairs we had East, West, A, and B, and then before I left, we built seven and eight as well. So yeah, when I left, we had Studio A, Studio B, which were the originals, um, East and West. West was the room that I worked in most of the time. I loved that room. Um, the only room I ever worked in that had a low ceiling out in the live room that just sounded amazing. Um, I did records in there uh, and did a lot of audio posts in there. And uh, and then Studio 7 and 8. And we had the two rooms downstairs that were still just like offices with junk on the walls doing Thundercats. Thundercats, Thundercats. Oh, I shouldn't say it. I'll probably get dinged for a copyright strike. Would you get more forage from Taxi if you use this plugin? Can't guarantee that, Andre. As much as I love you, dude, I can't guarantee that. Oh, that's interesting. Peter Greco says the focus is technology is to specifically target the frequencies that are compromised by compression and streaming. Yeah. My logic chops are not coming along. I haven't used logic since about January of 2021. I've just been so, so, so busy. Um, I worked with Neil Young at Triad Recording in Fort Lauderdale. At the time, it was really, uh, there just weren't a lot of big, you know, like world-class studios in South Florida. It was Criteria. Then a place was built around the same time Triad was built called Quadradial, and that was just down the block from Criteria. Uh, and we were about, you know, 25 miles away uh, in North Fort Lauderdale with triad recording and neil young literally just like found it in the yellow pages stumbled in the door saw me and remembered me from working together at criteria and went oh hey now want to do a record i went sure and that was that we ended up working it, it was so fun working with neil it was like you know 10 11 o'clock in the morning till six seven eight o'clock at night no crazy hours no tons of drugs no wild parties in the studio yeah that stuff is a real turnoff um Anyway, uh, it was just generally speaking, Neil, myself, and my assistant, Paul. And it was Paul that actually had to hold the, the mic on the stand in the boom and follow Neil around the room because he'd just walk around with his Martin strapped on playing stuff. I did have a lot of... It was a busy year this year. Crazy busy. I want to work with it more. Um, it's funny, I was on a 15-hour flight last spring, and I brought my laptop that, that's got logic on it, and I brought good headphones, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to spend the majority of this flight working uh, on logic so that I can get better at it and uh, that's that and I, I knew I had like 17 hours on the way home and uh, what's the name of that show Bray that's like friends with um, nerds Big Bang yeah I ended up watching Big Bang Theory reruns for like 10 hours in a row <laughs> instead of working on logic uh, the Neil Young albums I worked on comes a time uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the one after that. Here, let me get my phone out. Oh, this is fun. I'm just hanging out, talking. Yeah, working on a plane never works out. Rarely. I, I do a lot of good writing, a lot of marketing writing I do on airplanes very well. That way I don't have to look at the people next to me because I'm antisocial. What was the Neil Young record released after Comes a Time? Here is information from Wikipedia. 
Well, okay. Oh, look, there it is. Triad Recording, Fort Lauderdale. But it doesn't mention... <laughs> Record got good reviews. List of Neil Young Records. Harvest Moon. Harvest after the gold rush. <laughs> Uh, so I worked on Comes a Time. I worked on Stills Young, Long May You Run. That was with start out with all start out with Stephen and Neil. Then became all four of the guys: Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Then Crosby and Nash um, exited, and um, it became the Stills Young album, Long May You Run. Want to hear something cool? After senior prom, my girlfriend Shelly and I and about 20 other people went to somebody's house for a, a party down in their basement and we turned out the lights and turned on the black lights and all the cool, you know, like uh, Jefferson Starship posters and Jimi Hendrix posters. It was 1972. Yep. Yeah. No, 1971. And uh, somebody put on Deja Vu by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And I said to my girlfriend at the time, Shelly, said, oh, what I wouldn't give to work in a recording studio with a group like that. I love these guys. And a mere like two and a half years later, I was actually working in a world-class studio with those guys. It's funny how things can manifest. I'm looking for other records that I've got Neil Young's uh, Decade, which is a, a compilation of stuff. I know I've got stuff on there. Damn. That dude's got a lot of records. <laughs> Neil Young. Oh, come on, they keep repeating the same ones over and over again. I think it's got a flag on the front. Not an American flag, though. I don't know. I cannot find it. I know there were two other records that followed Comes a Time that had songs that I worked on while we were doing Comes a Time. He's got like a thousand albums. List of Neil Young albums in chronological order. The first two are Barn and Long Walk Home Neil Young recordings. I have 127 answers in total. Wow, that's one smart lady, huh? All right, so I worked on Long May You Run. That was with Stills and Young. I worked on Comes a Time. Oh, Russ Never Sleeps. Yeah, a little record called Russ Never Sleeps. Got a gold and a platinum hanging in the office from that one. Although they didn't give any studio or engineering credits on that one, but Neil did send me um, a platinum record. Oh, and Hawks and Doves. Worked on that one. Here, I can tell you which songs I worked on. Or maybe not track listing um no i don't want moods oh crap and this is the most user unfriendly site i've ever been on i worked on lost in space i did i think all of that one um, a song called Captain Kennedy. And I think I worked on Hawks and Doves as well. Um, the song Hawks and Doves. Let's see, what else did I work on? Rust Never Sleeps. Let's see. I love when these episodes turn into story time. <laughs> okay. Uh, on Rust Never Sleeps, I worked on Pocahontas, Sail Away, Powder Finger. I think that was it on that record. And 
Moment. Comes a time. Ooh, good ratings on that one. Comes a time. Does anybody really care about this? <laughs> Am I just talking to myself here? Let's see. I worked on Going Back, Comes a Time, Look Out for My Love, um, Lot of Love, Peace of Mind, Human Highway, Already Won, Field of Opportunity, Motorcycle Mama, Four Strong Winds. I think I just did a vocal overdub on that. That song was written by Ian Tyson, if I believe, a Canadian songwriting legend. And I think Neil had that one fairly well done. I might have done a few overdubs on that one. Anyway, that was a great record. I was very, very proud to work on that. Andre says it's a quarantine happy hour session. There you go. Oh, I wished I worked on Southern Man. I love that song. Did any artist record one track at a time? Very rarely back then. I mean, Neil kind of did, because it was just Neil, myself, and my assistant, Paul. So, you know, he would just strap on an acoustic, go sit on a chair, walk around the room. He'd walk around the room um, and then kind of come up with something, and he'd just give us the high sign, and uh, he would go sit down in a chair, and that would be that. He'd start playing. Um if you're talking about the console that Neil had at his ranch in, uh, it was on Skyline Drive. I can't remember the town it was in. Let's see, look at my thing, see if I have it. Nope, I don't have Neil in this one. I've got him in my little black book left over from the 70s. Anyway, all right, uh, I think you guys had enough time. <laughs> yes, Russ never sleeps. Um, yeah, Neil would play and sing at the same time. Um, and, and it made it a little challenging because sometimes he would keep the vocal. You know, we would just put like an 87 on his, on his face and an 87 on the guitar. And uh, then sometimes he'd go, oh, hey, let's try another vocal on that. So we'd have vocal bleed into the guitar. And sometimes we could get away with it, sometimes we couldn't, and he'd have to lay down the guitar part again. But he really did find the groove the best when he played along with it. But he's all about performance. Let's see, Peter worked with, uh, with Crosby years later. Uh, that's right, you know, one of these days, I always think about asking Crosby if he would do a road rally. Uh, Woodside, California, thank you, Dean Turner, that's where it was. He had his ranch, uh, Skyline Drive in Woodside. It was so laid back working with him. It was literally just, it was like this, you know? I mean, there was no like, oh my gosh, there's Neil Young in the room. It wasn't. It was just uh, like three friends working on a project, you know? <laughs> that that was Paul, my assistant. That was his first record that he ever got to work on was Neil Young. Talk about a lucky sucker. Anyway, all right, let's end this stream. Um, I think the chat will keep going. Uh, oh, it won't? Okay. We'll automatically get moved to the next one. All right, and at 2.35, for those of you who haven't seen, I really, I'm going to insist <laughs> that... Um, so many people just don't understand how powerful Master Writer is in helping you write songs. It's mostly about lyrics. It's actually got a place to record, you know, like scratch melody. You know, you can lay down like a guitar vocal and stuff. But if you've never really looked carefully at Master Writer, I don't make a penny from telling you about this. I just think it's great. I can't believe a lot of members do have it, but I can't believe everybody doesn't have it because it's like... I don't know, ridiculously cheap. Uh, they do it on a monthly subscription thing, and it's just like stupidly cheap. Like skip one trip to Starbucks and you've paid for it cheap. Um, there you go. Marion loves Master Writer. So at 2.35, we're just going to play the Master Writer video one more time just because I want as many people to know about it as possible. Um, so that's it. Uh, Peter Greco, 
I bid you adieu. Um, sorry that uh, your browser wouldn't talk to our software. Don't know what was up with that. Um, what inspired me to become a recording engineer? Seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show, uh, you know, with that first appearance, and then looking at pictures of uh, Jeff Emmerich on the back of Beatles records and anything else I could find with pictures of Jeff Emmerich. And um, you're welcome, Andrew Knox. I can't wait to meet you in person someday. It'll be great. Um, and uh, I just, I mean, I remember in language lab, in French lab in high school, where they stick you in a little cubicle, you know, with like an LP and you would listen. It would say, répète, s'il vous plaît. And I would go in there after school and commandeer one of the booths and do like little mixtapes and stuff using whatever audio technology they had in that room. I used to always get in trouble for that. You're not allowed to be in there without your teacher. Um, and I was in bands and stuff and I was always nerdy. I thought it was cool to like take the, I took the, the stereo amp from my parents' house and plugged my guitar into the front of it, took the output of the stereo amp into my, I had a Baldwin 212 guitar amp, if you can believe that. And, and use my parents' stereo amp, which is actually a mono amp, because stereo wasn't a thing really yet. Um, at least it wasn't a common thing, and we didn't have it. So um, I would use that amp as my distortion, as my preamp to drive distortion on my guitar. I got in trouble for that. Anyway, I just loved anything with knobs, buttons, EQ. And uh, then at 19 years old, I had that fateful day where I stumbled into one of the most famous studios in the world, and it happened to be the moment where the owner walked through and said we needed a new kid to sweep the floors. And I begged and cajoled and carried on like an idiot for a week until he finally interviewed me. I got the job and I've done nothing else since. Well, I don't actually work. And last time I worked on a record was 1996. Did produce three tracks for somebody, a taxi member that got a deal in DreamWorks. I produced three tracks, but I couldn't just like quit taxi and go make a record, you know? So I just did a long weekend to get those three rhythm tracks. Um, but I love the studio. So that's it, ladies and germs. I will see you back here in 15 minutes uh, to play you. Please don't miss the master. Right? If you're not familiar with it, um, definitely check it out. And uh, that's that. Adios. Adios.